Thank you for joining us for another power-packed message from Dr. Miles Monroe, provided by Monroe Global Incorporated and MonroeGlobal.com. We transform followers into leaders and leaders into agents of change. We hope that this message is a blessing to you as you advance your life and discover your purpose. Now, let's go into the message. Understanding the principle of reformation. Look at the word reformation. It's an interesting word. It has a prefix. And we'll talk about this during these next few sessions. Reformation is what that word really should be pronounced as. To reform something. And that's what transformation from the kingdom perspective is about. It's about reforming the planet. And I want to begin this session with an important statement that I want you to take a note of, write it down. And that is the most powerful global policy on earth today is the pressure to conform. This is a very serious statement. The global policy of the world today is the pressure to conform. You know, nations have policies, companies have policies, even some families have policies laid down in the home. But I'm talking about a big policy which has to do with the entire planet. The global policy that's prevailing in the world today is the pressure to conform. That leads me to my second point. Write this down. Globalization is a movement of conformity. Say that with me. Globalization is a movement of conformity. Globalization says everybody must conform to the same things. Get in line or get off. Be like everybody else or don't be. That's globalization. At least the point number three, very important. The goal of globalization is for all nations, all societies, all cultures, all peoples, and all communities to conform to one world system. That was not the original intent of the United Nations. The United Nations was formed to prevent war. It has now shifted its purpose to something more dangerous and its conformity. Globalization, therefore, the goal of it is to make sure that all nations, all cultures, all communities, all societies conform to the same systems. I want you to listen to me carefully. This is very dangerous. At least the point number four, I'll write it down. Conformity demands the surrender of your convictions, your values, your beliefs, your principles, your morality, and your distinctions. Conformity cancels uniqueness. Conformity says, forget what you believe. You must accept what we believe. Conformity implies forget what you consider is your culture. You must accept our culture. 
Conformity, therefore, cancels distinction. So, to conform means you, you get rid of your own significance. You cancel what makes you different. You abandon what makes you unique. This is a dangerous proposition. But it is happening right now in every nation. Therefore, we have some other issues. I call it the agenda to conform. Make a note. The whole world is in what I call a flux of change. Everybody is grappling with change. But the, the challenge is the world is changing, but they are changing away from some things. What are they changing away from? First of all, they're changing away from what we call traditional values. They are changing away from traditional moral standards. They are changing away from traditional systems. They are changing away from what we call traditional cultural norms. What we consider normal the last five years thousand years they are changing away from that they're also changing away from what we call traditional beliefs they are changing away from traditional rules they are breaking the rules that we had accepted as being time tested very dangerous world so this is what they call change to them change is moving away from these positions that we were living by for over 6,000 years, chronologically speaking. And that's the generation you live in. You live in a generation that's tampering with things that Egypt didn't touch. The Canaanites didn't bother with it. The Babylonians never questioned it. The Romans never dealt with it. The Greeks never tried to change it. This generation we're living in is so dangerous. It is literally touching things no other civilization touched. Of course, some of the things that they claim to be changing too is actually old. And so this is the world we live in. They are changing away from traditional laws. Now, this is important for us to understand that we live in this world. This is the world we have to go to school in. We have to go to work in. We got to start a business in. We have to hire people in. We have to build homes in. This is a dangerous world. Let me take you to my third point, and I call it the pursuit of change. Mankind is pursuing change with such deliberate seemingly insanity that the goal of contemporary movement for global social change is change away from these time-tested principles they are violating time-tested values that were established by the creator uh, in, in other words the, the, they are pursuing change in what we call our postmodern world and they are even willing to violate natural law this is dangerous they are so and when I say they I don't know who I'm talking about because somehow they are everywhere but they seem to have become generationally insane to the point where they are attempting changes that ignore natural law. Of course, you cannot ignore natural law. 
but we are attempting it. In other words, change is inevitable, but it should never be at the expense of principles. Principles are permanent. Man did not create principles. Humans did not create natural law. Humanity is not the source of spiritual law. And yet, we are attempting to make changes in our world, ignoring and violating these time-tested principles. The question is, will you sit by and let it happen? The problem is, if you don't do anything about it, you become a victim of it. You either leave the planet or you got to live under these changes. Now here is what I call the divine development strategy. God, the creator, has something to say about this. And I'm going to give you these thoughts. Please write them down. Number one, mankind was created to continue to create but not by violating the creator's laws inherent in creation. This is a deep statement. I want you to write it down and think about it for a week. First of all, it is very clear that God created you to be a creator. Creation is not finished. God finished his part. And on the seventh day, God says, this is good. I will rest from my work. But if you read the book of Genesis, after God says, I rest from my work, then God said to mankind, work. And he gave man his ability, his spirit, and gave man the most powerful force on earth, and that is a brain and a will. And he told the man, be fruitful. Multiply and fill the earth and have dominion over it. I thought God was finished. God says, no, I'm giving you the real estate. You build on it. I'm providing the property. You construct on it. And I want you to build on it according to my specifications and my architectural rendering. I want you to build my kingdom on earth and I want you to dominate the earth with my kingdom influence. That's your project. God left you but an assignment and gave you all the equipment you need. He gave you the physical property. He gave you the material. He gave you a brain. He gave you a mind. He gave you a will. He gave you intelligence. And then he did the most important thing. He gave you his spirit. He says, go kids, show me what you can do. Nothing makes a father more proud than to see his children continuing his work that he started. Am I right? When your child picks up your project and does it better than you, how do you feel? A parent doesn't want to do everything. Their joy is to see their children Take it to the next level. God says, I want mankind to take this planet I gave them and organize it, order it, restructure the arrangements on it, and give it order. By the way, the word garden in Genesis doesn't refer to vegetables and oranges. 
The word garden in Hebrew simply means, write it down, it means order. Order. God took the man and put him in a spot on the earth that had order. And then God says, multiply this order and fill the whole earth with order. You know, the word garden is used because if you think about it, what's the difference between a garden and bush? They, they, they both have plants. The difference is one of them has what? Order. The other has no order. Some people's lives are like that. They are bush, dressed in clothing. No order to their lives. They just grow wild. All kinds of wild animals nest in their lives. God says, I want order. I want this to be an orderly place. I want everything to be done decently and in order. That's why the term dominion is used. It has to do with government. Government brings order. Supposed to. Now, number two. The creator expects growth. He expected progress. But he expected it in the context of divinely inherent natural and spiritual laws. God was very clear to Adam. You are free to eat from any tree in the garden. Now that's an open check, but then he closed it by this, except he put a little boundary there. In other words, God will never give you freedom without boundaries. There has to be some order of restriction to keep you in order. In all of God's creation, he put boundaries in everything. You read the Bible often, don't you? Hopefully. And the Bible says, all through the Bible, all the New Testament, it always says, and the sea cannot overstep its boundary. Aren't you glad, Bahamians, in the Bahamas? You better give God a hand for that. A tsunami is not normal because the sea is misbehaving. A tsunami is when the sea breaks the law. How long you been living in the Bahamas or Jamaica or Barbados? Thank God the sea is still where you left it, where you meant it. God has built into creation laws. And these inherent, hey boys, inherent. Please now, remember that word. That's an important word. Inherent means you had nothing to do with this. There are some things that you met here and you cannot change them. And you can't vote them out. You can't pray them out. You can't fast them out. You can't bum rush them. These laws are built in by the manufacturer. I want you to, to think about it with like your car. When you bought your car, you didn't create your car. You went on the lot and the car was there. It wasn't produced by you. And when you bought the car, the car manual says, if you want this car to function, put unleaded gasoline in the tank now you have all your will you could form a committee to vote against gasoline in your car you can actually have a referendum on whether you should put gasoline in your car and the referendum could actually be passed that you ain't gonna put gas in your car no more you change the law and you decided grade A Florida orange juice no problem and so you vote, you win the vote, you go downtown, you buy the biggest and gallon bottle of orange juice, vitamin C and everything in it, you pour it in the tank. The problem is the function by gasoline is inherent. It's built in. So you cannot 
change an inherent law by your will. The will of the Ford Motor Company ignores your will. So if you want your car to run, you must always pray like this. Not my will, but thine, O oh Ford, be done. How am, I, how am I doing so far? See, in other words, some, some of us think we can pray against the manufacturer's will. The disciples asked Jesus, how should we pray? And Jesus said, simple, you should pray. Here's how to pray. Our manufacturer who is not on earth. In other words, these products didn't come from earth. They were sent to earth. The manufacturer is not even from here. The words father means source. If your car is a Ford car, the source of it is Ford. So Ford is the father of your car. The word father means source. But it also means sustainer, which means that Ford determines how the car functions also. Not the fact that it made it. It's the source and it is the sustainer of that car. You must do what Ford says for the car to function. God, Jesus says, is our father and he is where? In heaven. That means if you want to tamper with anything on earth, you must first consult heaven. If something breaks down on earth, you must consult the manufacturer to fix it because only the manufacturer has genuine parts. So if the social systems, the economic systems, the cultural systems, the educational systems, the political systems are not working on earth, don't call for a consultant from earth. Jesus said, when you petition, first locate the manufacturer, our source, who is in heaven. He says, now you got to respect him. Holy means you respect his name. In other words, the name on your car says Mercedes. Don't ignore that. Oh, this is deep. You got a Mercedes car parked in the parking lot. You better respect that Mercedes name. That's a holy name for your car. Because if you try to put a Toyota part on that car, some of y'all took your cars to an unauthorized dealer under the tambourine tree. Anybody here talking to me? And you're wondering why the car is worse than when you first took it in. It's because the unauthorized dealer ignored the holy name on your car and bought a, an alternative piece or maybe went to the junkyard let's not talk too much about that and found an old car with a part that looks similar <laughs> now the Bible says Satan comes as an angel of light he looks similar you better know the difference give God a hand you better know the difference there are people in high places who look right, talk right, even smell and dress right. You better make sure they genuine parts. The creator expects growth, but it must be within the context of his laws. In other words, when you talk about change, you must always do it in the context of the inherent laws laid down by the manufacturer. At least at point number three. Say it aloud with me, please. True change is growth and development within the boundaries of inherent natural and spiritual laws. Notice I used the word true change. 
A lot of changes that we are going through and considering are not true change. Yes. You know, it's like me, a male, going to get an operation to become a woman. So they cut off my penis and they put a little slit where it was and they say that they did a transgender surgery. The only problem is they didn't put a womb in there. So I'm simply a man with a cut. In other words, it's not an inherent change, it is a cosmetic adjustment. Hallelujah. This is serious business, you know. So God says, look, I want you to grow and I want you to progress and I want you to develop. I told you to fill the earth and develop it, of course, but not in violation of my inherent natural and spiritual laws. That's all God is saying. The earth was not designed to function without heaven. This is for individuals and for nations. Whenever you're about to make a decision in your business, in your relationship, in your marriage, in your teenage life, I want you to think first. What law of God does this violate? That's your first thought. And let me tell you, don't miss the next, this next session I'm going to do later. But listen to me. God has a built-in mechanism in every human to send an alarm when you're about to break a law. It's built in. You don't need no preacher, no pastor, no bishop, no apostle. God has an inherent mechanism built into the human system that goes off. It's called the conscience. You know when you're shacking up. Ain't nobody got to tell you that. You know when you're driving out to the beach and you ain't married that person about to park behind the bush. You don't need no anointing. There's an alarm. Beep, beep, beep. Stop, stop. Turn around. Drop them back home. Beep, 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 beep. But you ignore the alarm. It also goes off when you eat too much. You know, it ain't just enough to eat. the Bible says gluttony is sin. Just like adultery, gluttony too. So when you know you're full, <laughs> the system says stop. But you're looking at the plate while the conscience says stop. Your eyes override your conscience. And when you finish, you say you got itis. That ain't no itis, that's disobedience. <laughs> Are you with me? Yes. Believe me, everyone who doing wrong know they doing wrong. Anyone who's about to vote on a wrong law know they vote on the wrong law. You don't need no one to tell them. God has a built-in mechanism called your conscience. If you always obey your conscience, you will never have a regret. Think about it. You always regret violation of conscience. And you got to sleep with that regret. So God has inherent laws. Therefore, write it like this. Natural and spiritual laws are protected by conscience and creation. Creation protects them. See, creation protects itself, you know. You try to disturb nature, nature will turn around and disturb you. This happens all over the world. You know, when you go dig for oil, right? The oil was lying there for 5,000 years. Quiet, nice. Now, don't get me wrong, I ain't against oil drilling or for it. You know, I'm just giving you truth principles here. So the oil is nice, and the fish swimming on top of it for 1,000 years, no problem. 
and the reef happy. Now, you decide I am going to puncture this cavity. And that's what oil drilling is. It's puncturing a cavity that is under pressure. You must first take into account, am I willing to deal with the possible consequences of this going out of control when I puncture it? And what will nature do to me if I violate that conscience? Am I prepared? This past week, the second largest oil company in the world cried for mercy. Some of you all heard it this week. They said, if we keep paying out <laughs> the damages that are being required. You're all listening to you're looking at me like you're in this news. They said, we are going to possibly have to go to business. These guys got billions and billions. They said, yeah, but you see, we made a mistake and the cost may drive us out of business. My point is this, God has some laws built into nature. Respect those laws. Your body, for example, you know, someone asked me today, but Brother Miles, uh, uh, what do you think about oral sex? That's a big question being asked me all the time, you know, right, everything about oral sex. And I say, well, you know, that's a tough one. Because your mouth for eating. <laughs> oh, you're all smiling at me. I can leave that right there. <laughs> oh, boy. If you don't know the purpose of a thing, you will abnormally use it. Creation protects itself. And God has built into the world system and in our social system, conscience. Conscience protects God's laws. And when you do wrong, conscience will whoop you for the rest of your life. There are people sitting in this room today and watching this program that are still trying to get rid of things they did 50 years ago. Conscience have a way of keeping it alive. Thank God for the blood of Jesus that cleanses it, but it doesn't wipe it out. That's why I tell young people, do right so you don't regret your memories. God's laws are never given to restrict you or to oppress you. They are given to protect your memories. If you live right, you enjoy everything you remember. That's why we need the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. He cleanses us so that our memories don't affect us anymore. Forgiveness doesn't cancel memories. It takes the sting out of them. Now let me take you to this, to this aspect of change. So when we talk about change, we've got to be careful. First of all, to advance and to develop and to progress, we have to change. You cannot do what God says without bringing some change. God is not against change. God is a God of change even though he never changes. God has never repeated a miracle. He's always creative. He loves to be innovative, but he'll never break his law to innovate. Innovation is very interesting. People think that innovation means that you create something new. No. There's nothing new in this room. You'll never buy a new pair of shoes. It's impossible. It's impossible to buy a new dress impossible it's impossible to buy a new shoe or a new suit it's impossible to buy a new house it's impossible why because everything on earth is simply a new combination of old things your shoe 
the one you say is new is an old cow. Am I right? So here you are going into the store excited about this $60 shoe and it's an old cow. And in some cases it's less than a cow. It's plastic. It's oil byproducts. It ain't new. It's over 10 million years old maybe. But you call it new because someone recombined it in a different way. That's all. There's no such thing as an old, I mean, as new house. It's old rock and cement. Been around for a million years. But someone combined it in a new way. We call it innovation. God says, look, I'm not against you creating new things. But you can't do it in violation of my laws. So change requires looking at what's here. Let's talk then about the danger of change. Everybody thinking about civil society needing to be improved. Uh, yeah, have, you, have you ever heard these terms lately? Uh, your nation needs to come into the modern world. Or your people are backward. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. Uh, let's see, I gotta find somebody with an old house. Anybody been in the house for more than 20 years? Let me see your hands. You've been in the house for more than 20 years? Okay, let me ask you a question. You gotta smile now because you're on TV. Okay. How long have you been in that house? 30. Over 30 years, okay? She's been in one house for 30 years. Okay. Uh, did you all adjust the foundation? Never touched it. Hmm. You changed furniture in the house, though. Yeah, you painted it, improved it, you developed things in it, plants and everything, but you never touched the foundation? So that means you can actually develop things without touching things? Hmm. You can actually progress without moving certain things? Yes. Huh, interesting. So you have new furniture with old foundation? Yeah. Brand new curtains could actually put in an old foundation house? Hmm. Wow. So that means you can progress without touching the foundation. Okay. This is our challenge, identifying the foundations. Our societies, our nations must check what are the foundations so we don't touch the things that are immovable. All true change must occur within the boundaries of natural and spiritual laws. I hope I drive this point home enough. And this to me is a sign I showed you before. I love this sign. It shows me what the world looks like right now. Everybody say the words together. What's the first word? Lost. Second one. Confused. Unsure. Unclear. Perplexed. Disoriented. Bewildered. This is what the world looks like right now. And I say to you that not all change is improvement. Not all change is advancement, and not all change is progressive. Change will happen to everything. But here's the paradox. Change is only possible where something is constant. And I made this point before, I'm reinforcing it. You cannot change unless you know where the permanent stake is. In other words, we must be careful what we change. Not everything should be changed, and some things were created to remain unchanged and stable, like the foundation of that house. You could change the windows from jealousy windows to modern hurricane shutters, but don't touch that foundation. Otherwise, the government department will consider the house condemned. You don't want God to condemn your country because you tamper with his foundation. 
You can, you can work on equality with men and women. You can work on, you know, no abuse of children. You can work on, you know, uh, marriage between a male and female. You can work on a lot of stuff, but there's some stuff you don't touch. And somehow this generation seemed to be challenging God in his face, saying, we're going to change what you say can't be changed. And God is warning us, I will condemn your structure. In other words, never change, never confuse change with growth. I'm going to wrap up on this concept today because I, I want you to go and think about this for a while. Hey, boy, say growth. growth. It's not change. not change. Don't confuse the two. Let me explain what I mean. I have a picture of a lighthouse here for a reason. The lighthouse is an amazing structure. The lighthouse never moves. Only ships move. <laughs> and the lighthouse doesn't move because it protects the ships if a lighthouse was floating like humanism and secularism you can't take your ship in the ocean humanism says there's no ultimate truth you want to please listen to me carefully now. I want you to think about it before you go. Humanism and secularism makes man the judge of what is right and wrong. Humanism says the human has the ability to determine what is good, wrong, just, fair, right, wrong, up, down, acceptable, unacceptable. Which means that, that we actually are becoming a shifty society. The lighthouse protects us because it doesn't move. And anyone here in this room who's a marina will tell you they depend on that lighthouse all the time. They pray that the lighthouse is always there because that lighthouse tells them where they are and where they should not go. Ah, oh, you missed that. A lighthouse tells you where you are but also where you should not go. Don't go in that direction where you're going as a country. Why? The lighthouse tears that rock over there. You know, we, we, we somehow think we're smarter than God. But God is the lighthouse. He said, this is truth. This is right. And we tell God, no, we've improved lately. We're a little bit more intelligent than that, you know. Uh, we have become more modern. And God says, yeah, but you can move the lighthouse. A principle is like a lighthouse. And that's why these are the things you shouldn't change. And write them down. Don't forget it. I'm going to give you a key to life for the next 50 years. Write them down. These are the things you should never change and you will live a successful life. Number one, you should never change precepts. Precepts are original ideas from God. Number two, you should never change principles. Principles are what they call first law. The word prince means first. Principle means first law. Thirdly, you should never change purpose. The purpose of a thing is permanent. How old is your car? 25 years old. Good. So, can you now use it as a boat? No, because the purpose for the car doesn't change over time. Purpose is permanent. You have a blouse on, right? You had a blouse for 50 years, does it grow into something else? No, it remains the purpose that a blouse performs. In other words, you don't touch purpose. What's the purpose of my rectum? Excretion. So you don't change the purpose for it. It can't change. Your eye will never hear anything. <laughs> Am I right? Your mouth will never smell anything. It, the purpose is permanent. When God creates something, the purpose is set. Your feet will never become a hand, even though you may try to use it as a hand. It's never a hand. Purpose is permanent. What else don't you change? Number four, 
Never change natural law. It never changes. You cannot change natural law. Plants grow in soil. Plants need sunlight, period. It's permanent law. It's natural law. Number five, never change truth. Truth is original information. Write it down. Truth is very practical. For example, when you buy a television, in the box is a book. We call it the manual. The manual is the truth about the product. That's why it doesn't come from the retailer or the wholesaler. All truth comes from manufacturers. Oh boy, this is so important. See, we keep trying to get truth from customers, retailers, and wholesalers. Don't trust none of them. They don't know this product. That's why the manual comes in the box. The manufacturer does not write manuals. Sorry, I mean the, 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 the wholesaler doesn't write manuals. The manufacturer does. Because the manufacturer is the only one who knows the truth about the product. This is why when you buy a product and it doesn't work, they always say in the manual, ship it back to us at our expense. Don't touch it. If you open it, it says, then we cancel the warranty. So you never touch truth. You know, Jesus Christ... That, that ultimate statement of Jesus was it. I am the way to the truth that gives you life. That's the way he said it. I am the way to the truth that gives you life. In other words, I am the manufacturer of everything on this planet. I made it myself. And if you want it to function for you and give you life, you must get it from me. Get the information from me. Yes, That's why I preach the kingdom. That's the information he gave. This is the truth, the kingdom, he says. He who hears me. You know, Pilate was a Roman governor. The Romans were humanist. They adopted Greek philosophy. They thought that they were the ultimate truth themselves. And on the trial day, Christ stood before Pilate. And Pilate begins to ask him a question. Are you a king? And Christ says, yes, I am a king. He says, for this purpose was I born, to be a king. And then he says, and I came to testify of what is truth. It's a deep statement. And all those who hear me, he says, hear the truth. And Pilate responds in confusion. What is truth anyhow? See, even Pilate was unsure of his own education. He knew there was a problem with the Greek philosophy. He knew there was a problem with the Roman perspective. He knew that this wasn't right. Something wasn't right. And he said to Jesus, what is truth, man? I, I'm still looking for it. Please tell me what it is. Christ says, I am the way, and I am the truth, I'm the life. You want life, you get the information from me, because I'm the manufacturer. I know my products. That's why we need Jesus. I said, that's why we need Jesus. You need Jesus Christ not to go to heaven. You need him to live on earth, to make it through this confusion, through this misunderstandings of life. You need him to give you truth. You never change truth. Number foot six, never change roots. What's the root of things? Number seven, you never change foundations. Number eight, you never change the source. And number nine, you can never change spiritual laws. They are permanent. Whether you work them or not, they work. And number 10, you must never change your conscience. Conscience is permanent. It is there. It is built in. And you can't even shut it up. You could scream at your conscience, it'll scream back at you. You could try to drink liquor, it is still there when you wake up. Yes, you could sleep and take pills. When you come back, conscience says, here I am. It's permanent. You can't change it. This is why you should make your conscience your best friend. Because that's one friend who don't go nowhere and always talking to you. 
You can't change these things. Remember this list. And when you are about to make decisions in life, take this list out. I want you to go home and type this list up in your computer. I want you to print it out. Put it in your office space, in your warehouse, in your car. Put it on the mirror where you fix your face and comb your hair. Put it in your wallet. Make a little card out of it and put Miles Monroe on it. Make sure give me credit and hand it out. And give everybody, tell them this is how you live. Live by these 10 things and you'll have a good life. That's how you protect yourself, young people. That's how you protect yourself, old woman. <laughs> I ain't talking to you now. Don't the person right behind you. Don't, get, don't take it personal. Okay. Look at that list. Think about living according to that list. You can't go wrong. Let me give you an example before we pray. Here's a picture. I like this picture. A fish can never outgrow water. Now, fishes grow, right? So growth is not the same as change. A fish grows but never changes its environment because the environment is its source. The list says what? You cannot change your source. The source of a fish's life is water. So even though the fish may grow to be 10 feet, it's growing, it is changing in its growth phase, but it can never outgrow its source. I've never seen a fish say to me, I, I'm tired of water, I'm going on land today. <laughs> fish can't get tired of water. There's some laws built in that are permanent. You don't change your source. That's why Jesus says, God is your what? Father. The word father is the word Abba in Hebrew. It means source. You can't outgrow your source. I don't need God. Oh, you better shut up. Matter of fact, God calls a human who calls him dead a fool. And the reason why is because God is saying, the very breath you're using to say it, to say it is mine. So you got to be foolish. And God is patient with your foolishness. He lets you say it until you catch yourself. He's a source. Look at this one. This, this picture. Look at that tree. That tree is about, I did research on this tree on the, on the computer, on the internet. This tree is over 500 years old, they say. But it will not leave its roots. No matter how old you think you are, how mature you think you've grown, no matter how tall you may think you grow, you can never leave your roots. You can't change some things. Well, you know, my daddy and mommy, you know, they believe in God, you know, but I went to college now, you know, I know a little bit better. You better shut your mouth and go back to your daddy's God. How many got people go away to college? study little thing and they forget I've been there too you know I've been through all that stuff I studied all the junk they give me I studied, I studied it I got degree and all that stuff I don't believe most of it you can go away and come back still sane loving Jesus am I right doc you, you, people walk away saying I have, I have outgrown my, my father's religion I've outgrown you know BFM I've outgrown what are you talking about You cannot outgrow grow your source. Look at that tree hanging on to it for their life. It's hanging on to that root. Branches, leaves, big, powerful, but it's hanging on to that their root. And that root is hanging on to the soil. Because they know where their source is. When a man begins to think he doesn't need his source, it is suicide. some things you cannot change this building that you see is on that foundation they poured the foundation and they built the building the building is over 65 stories high but it doesn't leave that foundation no matter how tall it grows it has to stay right there no matter how modern the furniture is it's still attached to that old foundation. No matter how we adjust things in our society and try to upgrade some things, may we never move away from our foundation. And I believe there's some things that need to be adjusted. Of course we can improve in some areas, but there's some things we cannot touch. 
Am I coming through yet? I'm showing you. I want to drive this home. Don't you ever think you can outgrow God? You know, Jesus said something very deep in John 15. He said, he said, uh, I am the vine and you are the branches. Now, when I was a little kid, I didn't know what that meant because, you know, you know we, we don't have no vineyards in the Bahamas. But there was a vine growing in the neighbor's house next door to us. And we used to go play in that bush all the time in Bain Town where I grew up. And there was a vine, a grape vine there. These folks were Spaniards. I think they bought it with them. They were from some Spanish country. And, and we used to go there and, man, we used to go there and take grapes in that place. Steal. I save now, okay? I'm okay. And <laughs> so one day I decided, what we're going to do is we're going to take a piece of the vine and we're going to catch it and have our own grape tree. So I broke the branch off and took it in the yard, dig a hole, and I put, you know, put it in the hole, and, and every day I went looking into this thing. I put water on it, you know, put a little dirt around it, and the thing keep dying. I keep praying, <laughs> putting water on it. It keep dying. And look, I keep coming back. It was dead in three days. I'm like, what's going on? I rebuke in Jesus' name. I just pray for this. Oh, Jesus, please let it grow. And I keep putting this fertilizer, all this stuff. I put horse manure. The thing died. So I was very upset. I went crying to my mom. I said, Mom, I, I tried to plant the grape tree and it wouldn't grow. She said, you tried to do what? I said, I wanted to grow a grapevine. She said, where you get that from? I said, the Lord just dropped it from the sky. <laughs> she said, bring it to me. Let me see what you got here. And I went in the yard, picked up this dead branch of the grape, bring it to my mom. And my mom says, boy, you stupid. I said, what do you mean I stupid? She says, you can't, this can't catch. Catch means grow, you know. So I said, why? She says, this is not the vine. This is the branch. I said, but aren't they the same? She said, no. She said, only the vine could catch. Branches have no life in them. And then I got a revelation that day that the green part of a grape vine has no life. The life comes from that gray vine. And the grapes grow on the green part. So the grapes and the leaves get their life from the branch. If you break the branch, there's no life in it. So it cannot reproduce. In other words, the source of life for the branch is the vine. And if you remove the vine, a bit the branch from the vine, not only does it die, it never can bear any more fruit. So Jesus said, I am the vine. You, personally, nationally, community-wise, socially, economically, you are the branch. I am the vine. Next statement, if you abide in me, stay attached to me, yes, sir. then I will abide in you. I'll give you juice. And you can ask anything you want, he says, and you shall have it. It'll be fruitful. But then he added, for without me, oh boy, you can do Nothing. Give him a hand. Boy, that's heavy stuff. I was trying to change the natural law when I planted the branch. And creation disagreed. You and I have no ability to sit in a room and decide nature. And we cannot do anything if we detach ourselves from the vine, God, the truth. 
That's why our nations, we need God in the middle of the country, right in the middle, boom, and attach everything to God. Attach everything to God. Every department, every ministry, every idea, every investment, attach it to God. And he gives it life. How come many governments have never called a national day of prayer? How come they let the church do it? Wouldn't it be great, like David the king used to, used to do, call a national day of fasting? No wonder why Jerusalem prospered as the most powerful city in the part of the world for over 200 years. David knew without God, we can do nothing. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. You know, we were discussing with the commission the, the other day, and I was telling them, you know, the opposition is we'd like to see the preamble enshrined. And one of the commissioners said, you know, and I understood it with his position. He said, you know, well, you know, in a democratic society, you cannot just claim one God because democracy means you are open to many other religions. Well, I sat up straight in the meeting. I said, I disagree. If I respectfully disagree with that. I said, uh, every nation must decide which God is their Lord. We don't have any problems with other people coming in here, but they should at least know who our God is. Now you all clap, man. You, all, you, all, you, all. you understand? You, you. Democracy doesn't mean open season. Everybody's welcome. But when you come in my house, you need to know who the rules are. This, this is the rule. You, I ain't got no problem with that. Because if you don't have your, your vine identified, you got all kinds of funny branches all over the place. And the fruit you will bear will be so confused. Your kids don't know what to eat. And that's what happened to, to, to Great Britain. Every time I go to Great Britain, I'm amazed. Britain is the one who gave us God. You can't find God in Britain. You need to travel with me and see some things. Big churches in Britain are now apartments. Churches, cathedral, they made them apartments. Other churches, they made them restaurants. Gone. And they got Muslims and Buddhists and Hindus and Pakistan temples all over the place. Why? Democracy. It's okay to be different. That's right. Let's be different. Remember now, I began this session by saying what? The world wants conformity. Conformity means nobody is distinctive. Everybody is like everybody else, and everybody ain't nothing. Do you understand? Maybe there's no identity. What, what are you? I don't know. We are everything. You can't be everything. How you can be everything? If you are everything, you ain't nothing because we can't distinguish you. The building can never outgrow its foundation. Finally, here's the one I like. You can't change ancient laws. Read aloud Proverbs 22 verse 28. Read. Do not move an ancient boundary stone that was set up by your ancestors. This is found in Proverbs 22, verse 28. Do not move what? An ancient boundary stone. That's the problem the world have today with that word ancient. <laughs> so boy, being married to one person is ancient, but you need someone to decide. That's what they're telling people. They tell your husband that at work. <laughs> and they're serious about that because they got three or four, you know, spare tires in the car. When the, and they said they call it ancient. For you to think that two women cannot get married is an ancient 
archaic idea. You need to, to become more sophisticated. You gotta, you gotta get modernized. You just, just, the Bible says what? Do not move an ancient boundary set up by your ancestors. Here's another verse, Jeremiah 6 verse 16, read. This is what the Lord says. Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it. And you will find rest for your souls. But you will say, we will not walk in it. Study that verse for the next three days. Put it on your, on your Facebook. Let, let people read it. I'm serious. Share this word. Because this is important for the world to hear right now. Maybe a politician might read it on your Facebook and something might happen. Look at that verse. God says, when you are at the crossroads, and that's where we are, where you try and decide how to fix things, what to change, and what to adjust, and what to recommend. He says, now before you do anything, he says what? Check for the ancient paths. Line up with what doesn't move. And then he says, walk in it. And you'll have what? Rest. I was telling someone in my office this morning, I said, you know, once you do right, right you go sleep. <laughs> once you do right, that's just always do right, and you ain't got to worry about it. And the wicked might seem to prosper. The Bible says, fret not yourself because of evildoers. Don't worry about that. They look like they got away. They ain't got away. You know, and they ain't got away. Just go, keep doing right. Keep doing right. They didn't get away. And you know they don't get away, right? You see it always happen. That they always get caught. You do right all the time. Stay with the ancient boundaries. You know, a few years ago, they started saying, you know, well, you know, God is a female. Because, you know, calling him he is male chauvinistic. So they made a Bible called she, you know. <laughs> And they got all the scriptures, you know, uh, the Lord, her God, you know, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not warn. She maketh me to lie down. And the whole Bible is written like that. In other words, we are, we are outgrowing this text. You all are so ancient. He says, come to the Father. He said, no, come to her. But that, that Bible says. This, this is how people are thinking. By the way, that's how ignorant that person is because the word father is not a gender. It means source. And that's why the male is called father. He's the source of the woman. Nothing to do with male chauvinism. It has to do with the practical function of creation. We allow ignorance to become policy. Because no one challenges it. No one questions it. I want you to sit in your place of work the next 10 years and tell them, let me give you some advice on some things. Because you seem to be thinking that you are so smart. And remind them of their ignorance. He says when you come to a crossroads, he says go back to the ancient path. Every young person goes crazy for four years. And the smart ones come back to the foundation. Anybody here know what I'm talking about? Yeah, you remember your age when you went insane? Yeah, you test your parents' belief, you test the church, you test your boundary, you test everything, you come back limping. Boy, they was right anyhow. <laughs> you know, you come back with your little memories and everything, you know, dragging behind you. All kind of regrets. <laughs> Train a child in the way they should go with ancient laws. And when they are older and wiser, they come back to them. Anybody come back? I back. You cannot improve on ancient laws that God laid down. Uh, here's one. Proverbs 22. Read it again. Different verse. Do not move an ancient boundary stone set up by your forefathers. It changes the word. Forefathers. Colossians 2.8, read. See to it that no one takes you captive, Paul says, through what? Hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world, 
rather than on Christ. He says, stay away from these sophisticated philosophical perspectives because they are there to deceive you. He says, you must not follow what humans created. Human traditions. And that's what we're doing now. We're trying to use humans to define things now. We want to ignore the natural and spiritual laws of life. And Paul says these are principles of what? The world. The world is what? The system. Principles are important. Principles have to do with, again, laws. And the Bible calls Satan uh, principality. That's a deep word. Principality. Principality is, has to do with a ruler that rules through principles. So in other words, if you watch soap opera long enough and he feeds you these principles that when you, you know, when you have problems, you know, you go sleep with somebody or when you get frustrated, you, you drink something and you watch that for 20 years, you begin to think that way, don't even know. The principles are set in. So you find yourself committing adultery and wonder why was that so easy? Because the principle was being converted to your mind through that soap so opera. That's the, the principality. The Bible calls it strongholds of the mind. That's why I'm very careful what I even watch as a movie. Because all movies have principles that they're feeding your mind. And you watch it long enough, you end up thinking it's okay. That's acceptable. And that's why, again, you know, the, even the way we, we give out news in our countries, you know, the, the, the headline is, can, can be so, so negative, but after a while they're negative no more. And then all of a sudden you start expecting it. And the first thing in the, in the newspaper comes, you say, let me see who get killed today. When in fact it used to be a shock. Now you look for it. It's a principle. It's, it's, it's converting a country to accept murder as normal. Principality. Paul says that philosophy will deceive you. And deception takes place here in the mind. And that's why you must be careful not to move the boundary stones and let people invent these new traditions. And it happens very subtly, you know, it, it happens subtly. You know, I mean, most of the newscasters I see on TV now, you know, they, they got questionable, you know, backgrounds. And, and you see them every day, and after a while you begin to say, it's okay. And then you accept it. And all of a sudden, you, you think it's okay. You don't talk about it anymore. don't speak against it anymore. You, it, it's okay, you say. And now you become deceived. That's what happened to Lot. Lot lived among people for so long, he thought it was okay. God never thought it was okay. And Lot lived with them. And they knew him. He accepted it. And God says, no, I want to correct this problem. The philosophies and the traditions of men. Let's write this statement down. He says, the principles of the world is first laws. We need to get God's principles back in our system. That's why the Bible is important. This is why God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. These are God's principles on which you build a social structure. God gave Moses the Ten Commandments not to start a religion. God told Moses to build a holy nation. And he gave him ten laws. Because laws create culture. And culture produces your children. And your children produce your nation. So if our laws are right, we'll have a right country. If the laws are contaminated, our nation is destructive. I hope today that you've been reminded that there are some things we should never change. You go back and take stock of your life. You're here today and you're not attached to Jesus. You have no life in you. You're existing from day to day without any life from God. You can be alive and be a living dead. I hope that you attach yourself back to God.
Thank you once again for listening to this message as we hope that it has been a blessing to you. Our goal is to show you new paths and opportunities so that you can discover your purpose. It is your love, support, and partnership that makes Monroe Global possible. Please visit us online at www.monroeglobal.com for more product, partnership, or to join us at one of our live events around the world.